Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh oh. This happens sometimes. <clears throat> Steve, are you ready? Uh, I think you're muted, Steve. Yeah. This is the culprit here. Okay. I heard you a little bit, so. Yeah. Well, the, 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 this music is the music that I would play before I would teach. So I had this sort of standard loop that I would play in preparation for my online classes. So I always had five minutes of this calming music before I had to confront my, <laughs> my class. And now these weird, these uh, high-tech spe- uh, headphones I have play the music anyway. No matter what I'm doing, they play this music. <laughs> so you got a chance to hear some <laughs> prepare to teach number theory music. <laughs> Great. All right. Are we ready to go? Okay. All right. Then um, our, whoops, our speaker now is Dick Gross. He is equally retired from UCSD and Harvard, and he will speak to us on the Frick and McBeath curve and triple product L functions. Go ahead, Dick. Thanks very much, Jim. And also, thanks for the invitation. So uh, Steve and I have known each other a long time, uh, maybe the longest of anyone here. We were in the same undergraduate class at Harvard. Uh, here's a picture of Steve taking freshman year, as far as I can tell. And uh, <laughs> uh, to give you an idea how long ago we were students at Harvard, uh, we took algebra from Richard Brower. It was a fantastic class. And uh, then after getting out, Steve went right on to graduate school. I meandered around a little bit, but uh, we met each other again at this, uh, whoops, see, now it's not working. Uh Uh-oh, I'm not able to advance my slide. Let's try again. Okay, your find is on also for some There we go. My what is on? Find. Find? Ugh. I'm gonna go out of this full screen mode and just do it the way I know how to do it. It's too, it's too annoying. I'll be right back, everybody. I'll be right back. Here we are. Let's share a screen. Uh-huh. Now I don't even see share screen, sorry. Oh, here it is, share screen. Here we go. Try that. And I'm back where I was. Yep. I don't seem to be able to advance it, guys. I got to do this all over again. Sorry, very much sorry. Maybe I've closed the find. There's a find. Where is find? Oh, it's gone now. In the upper right corner of your screen, it was opening as if you're looking for find text and it might be looking for you to advance over there instead of a slide. Yeah, over there. Slightly more to the right. Yeah, it's. Anyway. But we I can. That. All right, hold on. We can see your screen now. All right, oh. we both participated in the uh, summer school on automorphic functions at Corvallis, this great summer school that uh, introduced all of us to the Langlands' ideas. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I just can't advance this. And back. Went oh. backwards. Yeah, but it doesn't go forward. It doesn't go forward. And my wife is going to help me. I apologize for all the technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, here we go. Nope. I think I can do it now. So Steve actually attended the lectures. That was the difference. I didn't see much of them up at the conference because I just gave up. And we want, wrote only one joint paper together on heights and uh, critical values of the triple product L function. And um, this paper wasn't that much. Uh, we just made a little bit more precise a theorem that Steve had proved with Michael Harris a year before, which I'll mention later in the talk. But it wasn't, I think, a a useful paper for Steve because in the last section of the paper, I pressed him on what would happen to the uh, first derivative when the sine of the functional equation was minus one. And so we had to look at how we got the L function and it was through this miraculous, uh, miraculous integral representation that had been found by Paul Garrett. And the integral representation involved critically a Ziegel-Eisenstein series of genus three, and in our case, weight two. 
And uh, when the sign of the functional equation was minus one, we noticed that this Eisenstein series vanished in the center of its critical strip. And so what was important to calculate were the Fourier coefficients once you took its derivative, which was a non holomorphic modular form. And Steve set out to compute some of these Fourier coefficients. Uh, Don Zagier helped a little bit. And in the meantime, I was out computing arithmetic intersection numbers on a triple product with Kevin Keating. And, and some of these things matched up. And so Steve got interested in it. And, and I think that was the first incoherent Eisenstein series he met. And he developed it into this magnificent program, which has been central focus of number theory in the last 25 years. And uh, for me though, it was a little disappointing because before I wrote this paper, I thought of Steve as a, an absolute paragon of virtue in every way, but I discovered he had a fatal flaw and uh, that fatal flaw meant that we could no longer uh, collaborate uh, in the future. And I'll discuss that fatal flaw uh, on Wednesday. So as far as this talk is concerned, uh, the first part is joint work with Noam Elke, who I don't mind working jointly with because he knows a lot more than I do. And uh, <clears throat> we were guided in that part by a beautiful talk, uh, which you can find on the web on the Frick and McBeath curve by Yap Tup. And uh, the material on triple product L functions was for me motivated by a very surprising result, which recently appeared in the literature um, by Dean Bisogno, Wanlin Lee, Daniel Litt, and Padma. Srinivasan, and uh, I want to thank all of them for that. So <clears throat> before I tell you about the Fricka McBeef curve, uh, I'll tell you about Hurwitz curves, of which the Fricka McBeef curve is a special case. So this all comes from a theorem of Hurwitz, uh, where he determined the automorphism group of uh, complex algebraic curves. So we assume a curve is a genus at least two, and let G be the group of its automorphisms. And Hurwitz proved that G was always a finite group. That's not true for elliptic curves or the projective line. And its order was bounded above by 84 times G minus one. There's a famous paper he published in 1893. This is a nice theorem to prove in a course on algebraic curves because it follows almost immediately from the riemann hurwitz formula. Now, Hurwitz got interested in the case where equality held, namely where the order of the group was 84 times G minus one. Those curves are rare. We'll call them Hurwitz or H curves. And uh, he showed that if equality held, the quotient of the curve by the group was the projective line of genus zero. And moreover, the Galois covering with group G was ramified at only three points of the projective line and moreover, the ramification groups were the cyclic subgroups of order two, three, and seven in the group. Notice that 84 is the group divisible by two, three, and seven. So there are elements of order two, three, and seven in the group. And uh, if, you, if you wanna think about this in, in terms of a universal cover of the projective line ramified at three points with these inertia groups, that shows that the finite group G is a quotient of the hyperbolic triangle group, which is in some sense the fundamental group of this situation. So that has three generators, x, y, and z of orders two, three, and seven, and their product is one. And the hyperbolic triangle group is a discrete subgroup of the automorphism group of the upper half plane. And that, that <coughs> triangle group had been studied earlier by one of Hurwitz's teachers and mentors, Felix Klein. And here's a, here's a picture of the fundamental domain or, or, or of a tessellation of the unit disk by um, <clears throat> the hyperbolic, by fundamental domains of, for the hyperbolic triangle group. A fundamental domain consists of two of these triangles, one black, one white. And you can see the, um, <clears throat> the elliptic points of order two where four triangles meet and three where six triangles meet and seven where uh, 14 triangles meet. Well, uh, Suppose we have a Hurwitz curve, its automorphism group is G. And so therefore we have a covering map, the, the universal group maps to G and uh, let gamma be the kernel of this surjective homomorphism. And then you have a uniformization of the Hurwitz covering. Namely, if you take the quotient of the upper half plane by gamma, which is a subgroup of finite index in the hyperbolic triangle group, uh, that's a the Riemann surface X, and that maps down to P1 of C, which is the quotient of the upper half plane by the triangle group. So when people try to construct Hurwitz curves, 
It's two completely different approaches. Some people try to construct the group G and some people try to construct the subgroup gamma. So if you wanna construct the group G, you just have to find generators for the group which have orders two, three, and seven with product one. Then it's a quotient of this universal group because then it has just some more relations. So that's what the group theorists do. They, they uh, prove that groups like the monster occur as quotients of this hyperbolic triangle group. They know of all the, the list of the finite simple groups, which groups do and which groups don't. <coughs> However, <clears throat> from the point of view of number theory, we're gonna construct the subgroups gamma finite index using some congruences later. So one thing I want to, um, one thing we're going to need is that when you have a Hurwitz curve, <clears throat> the group of automorphisms acts linearly on the differentials of the first kind. It gives a, a linear representation of G. And now that, it, that representation has no invariance. Uh, there, there no, no copies of the trivial representation occur because the quotient curve has genus zero and the invariant differentials would be holomorphic differentials on the quotient curve. However, if you have a non-trivial representation, it usually does occur. And in fact, we have a formula for its multiplicity. Uh, well, not exactly its multiplicity, the multiplicity of V plus the multiplicity of the dual representation. You can calculate that using the Lefschetz fixed point formula because that's the multiplicity of V in the sum of the differentials and the dual representation. And by Hodge theory, that's the, that's the, um, that's the, first homology group. And uh, so you get a nice formula for the multiplicity of V. Now this right-hand side, the dimension of V minus the dimension of V fixed by the involution, the dimension of V fixed by the element of order three, the dimension of V fixed by the element of order seven, that's approximately the dimension of V over 42. And since these two multiplicities are usually pretty close, the multiplicity of V is about the dimension of V over 84. And it, it's known that these groups are almost simple so that the dimensions of the representations go up. So, so once the genus is at least a million of a Hurwitz curve, all the irreducibles but the trivial representation uh, do occur in the uh, differentials of the first kind. Okay, now uh, the first few genera of Hurwitz curves are 3, 7, 14, 17, 1, 18. Not every genus has a Hurwitz curve. For example, there's, there's no curve of genus two with 84 automorphisms, but the first one is the famous klein quartic of genus three with this equation, and its automorphism group is isomorphic to the simple group PSL27. You can't see that from this model because you can't see all the automorphisms, but that's the most famous of the Horowitz curves. But the next one, which is uh, of genus seven, is also a unique, the unique curve of genus seven with six times 84, which is 504 automorphisms. And it was studied by Fricke in 1899 is a quotient of the upper half plane. He actually writes down in his paper a fundamental domain for it. And um, the automorphism group is a PGL28, isomorphic to that, which is also the group SL28, if you want to write it that way. And in this case, as in the case of the klein quartic it's a very rare situation. The representation on the differentials of the first kind is actually irreducible. If you go back to that multiplicity formula, for almost all V that you put in from the character table of PGL28, you get multiplicity zero. And for a unique one, which is a seven dimensional representation in the discrete series, you get multiplicity one. And there are several discrete series representations of this group. And uh, you, one knows that discrete series of PGL2 are indexed by pairs of characters <coughs> of the non-split torus. Now the non-split torus in this case is a cyclic group of order nine. And this discrete series that occurs, and that's gonna be important to us, are associated to the two cubic characters. They're inverses of each other of that non-split torus. It has another way of characterizing it is it's the unique discrete series that has a rational character. Okay, now why is it called the fricka mcbeef curve if it was discovered by Fricka? Because McBeef uh, found an algebraic model for it in 1965. He wrote down equations for it, in fact, equations for its canonical model in P6. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna do that whole theory, but I'll show you how you can get some interesting information about the curve just from the knowledge of its, the representation of the group on the differentials of the first kind. Because if you restrict the representation <coughs> of PGL28 to a Borel subgroup, uh, 
it's an irreducible representation. In fact, it's the unique irreducible representation of higher dimension of the Borel subgroup. The Borel subgroup, the unipotent group, is an elementary abelian group of order eight. That's the additive group of the field of eight elements. And then uh, <coughs> the torus is the multiplicative group of the field of eight elements, which is cyclic of order seven. And one knows that discrete series restrict irreducibly to the Borel. And the unique irreducible representation of the Borel of dimension bigger than one is one where the unipotent subgroup acts via the seven non-trivial characters, uh, which are quadratic characters because it's an elementary abelian two group. And um, these seven different eigenspaces for the unipotent <coughs> subgroup are permuted transitively by the cyclic torus of order seven. So just knowing the, which the irreducible representation is of the uh, full group gives you a very nice restriction to the Borel. Now, if you think about that a little bit, if you let u chi be the kernel of one of these quadratic characters, then the quotient by that Klein four group is an elliptic curve because there's a unique invariant for u chi on this seven dimensional representation. The other, uh, it, it acts non-trivially on the other six eigenspaces. And so you get seven different quotients of the fricka mcbeath curve, which are elliptic curves. But since these, uh, these characters are permuted transitively by the torus, these seven elliptic curves are all isomorphic. And a little bit more analysis, which I'm not gonna do here, shows that the J invariance of this elliptic curve, which determines isomorphism over the complex numbers is 1792. And finally, and this is actually quite important for us, the Jacobian of the fricka mcbeath curve is isogenous to the product of this elliptic curve seven times. And that's because <clears throat> if you take these seven different quotients and you pull back the invariant differential on E of chi to the fricka mcbeath curve, you get seven differentials which span the different eigencomponents for the unipotent subgroup. So they give a basis of the differentials of the first kind on the fricka mcbeath curve. And they're all elliptic differentials. So I have only two periods. And that gives the isogeny from the Jacobian to the product of E seven times. Now, <clears throat> the, rest is not, the, the rest of this analysis is not really relevant for my talk, but you'll see why I'm gonna do it. Since E doesn't have complex multiplication, 1792 is not the J invariant of something with complex multiplication. And the Jacobian is seven copies of this elliptic curve. If you take the group of homomorphisms from the Jacobian to this elliptic curve, that's a free abelian group of rank seven, right? You have uh, projections to the different factors give you the basis. Okay. Now, on the other hand, this group of homomorphisms can be identified with what we call the mordel Vey lattice. Namely, it's the same as the morphisms from the curve X to E, the coverings of X to E, up to translation by E. The reason for that is, <clears throat> if you have a homomorphism from the Jacobian, you can restrict it to the curve embedded in the Jacobian, that's unique up to translation by E. And that gives a morphism from X to E. And conversely, if you had a morphism from the curve to E, then uh, E is an abelian variety. And so a morphism from a curve to an abelian variety factors through its Jacobian. And if you think of what a morphism is from X to E, that's giving a point in E in the function field of X. So that would be like the more del Vey group, except that that's an infinite group because you have the points of E and C. So if you mod out by the points of E and C, um, <clears throat> that's a free abelian group and it's a free of rank seven. So all these interpretations of the Mordel Vey lattice are valuable. And the one which gives the morphisms from X to C shows you that you have a quadratic form on this lattice, which is given by the degree of a morphism, which is some uh, positive integer if the morphism isn't uh, just the constant one. And uh, the reason it's a quadratic form, well, that's really the theorem of the square and cube, but, but just to give you a, a really uh, a, a bare hands argument, Suppose we multiply the morphism by n. So the group law here is of course the addition law in E. So multiplying a, a, a morphism from X to E by n would be composing it with the, the original morphism with multiplication by n on the elliptic curve. And the mul that multiplies the degree of the isogeny by n squared. 
So that might give you some reason to believe that the degree of amorphism was a quadratic form. Okay, so from the Fricka McBeef curve and this elliptic curve, we get a Euclidean lattice. And the natural question that Elkies and I wanted to address is, what is this Euclidean lattice of rank seven? And miraculously, it turns out to be related to the E7 root lattice. Namely, it's the twice the E7 weight lattice, which has index two to the sixth in the E7 root lattice and is an even lattice. And the theta function of this, uh, of this uh, lattice of morphisms is given below. So there are 56 morphisms of degree three up to translation and 126 morphisms of degree four up to translation, et cetera. So I only did this slide because <clears throat> as Michael said earlier, you can't give a talk in honor of Steve without introducing a theta function. So here it is, here's a theta function of weight seven halves. And uh, Steve, you'll be happy to hear that um, not only is this a theta function, but because this weight lattice is, um, <coughs> its class is unique in its genus, this is also an Eisenstein series by the ziegel weigh formula. And it's uh, Henri Cohen's famous Eisenstein series of weight seven halves. So these coefficients are actually the values of L functions of imaginary quadratic uh, Dirichlet characters evaluated at minus two. And for those of you like me who like exceptional groups, you'll see a lot of E7 in this theta function. For example, 56 is the dimension of the minuscule representation and 126 is the number of roots of E7, et cetera. And that's all somehow miraculously related to the Fricka McBeef curve. Okay, now let's continue. Now, the rest of the talk is going to be more about how the Fricka McBeef curve interacts with arithmetic. And uh, that all comes from uh, Shimura's very great paper on the construction of class fields and the zeta functions of algebraic curves. So uh, Shimura wrote many, many great papers, but I think this is one of his uh, top three papers. So it's really uh, phenomenal results. The whole theory of Shimura curves is, uh, is developed in this ca case, and particularly the Shimura curves where the base field is not the rational numbers, which are really quite uh, miraculous. Okay, so what does Shimura do? First of all, he introduces, whoops, did I just lose it again? Could be. Mm -hmm. This is great. All right, I went backwards. Can I go forwards? No. Here we go. We let K be the cubic field of discriminant seven squared. So that's the real subfield of the seventh roots of unity. Where did that come from? We're gonna soon see. And the ring of integers of this field has a nice property. It's not only a principal ideal domain, but it has strict class number one. So every ideal, like the rational numbers, has a totally positive generator, positive at the three real places. It's a totally real field. Uh, that also means that uh, any unit which is positive at all three places uh, is a square. So since it's cubic field it, and it's totally real, it has three real embeddings. I'm gonna distinguish one by calling it V. And I'm gonna consider the quaternion algebra over this totally real field, which is split at the place V and ramified at the two other Archimedean places and is split at all finite places. So the only ramification is at infinity at two of the places and it's split at the third. And a nice property of this quaternion algebra, which follows from the uh, strict class number one business is that all the maximal orders in it are uh, conjugate. So you can pick one, I'll call it R. And the units in R of norm one, I claim contain elements of finite order four, six, and 14, because the, the, the order R, because it's unique up to conjugacy contains the ring of integers in all quadratic extensions of K that are, <clears throat> that are not split at the primes W and W prime, which are complex at those two primes. And in particular, it contains the ring of integers in all quadratic extensions, which are CM. And in particular, it contains the ring of integers in all cyclotomic quadratic extensions. And there are three qua cyclotomic quadratic extensions of this <clears throat> ring namely the ones you get by adjoining fourth roots of unity or 
third roots or sixth roots of unity. Those come from cyclotomic extensions of Q. And then because this is a totally real subfield of seventh roots of unity, you can also adjoin a seventh root of unity and get a quadratic extension. So that's an element of order 14. And those elements all have norm one down to A because they're roots of unity. And consequently, if you take the quotient by plus or minus one, that contains elements of order two, three, and seven miraculously. And Shimura shows using volume computations of the fundamental domain that this quotient, this unit group in the quaternions, modulo plus or minus one is isomorphic to the hyperbolic triangle group. That's very surprising. Most of the triangle groups are not related to the quaternion algebras at all, but this hyperbolic triangle group is. And so <coughs> Shimura <coughs> views the Frick and McBeath curve completely differently. And let's, let's I, I can't say I really follow his paper. I've tried to read it many times, but I, I invariably grind to a halt. So I'm gonna present the results on Shimura curves more in the language of, of, of Deline <coughs> in his paper, uh, Travo de Shimura. So let G be the algebraic group over the totally real field, uh, which is an inner form of PGL2, uh, where the rational points are the multiplicative group of this quaternion algebra divided by the multiplicative group of the field. If the quaternion algebra were split, which it isn't, that would be PGL2, okay? And inside the finite adelic points, now the finite adelic points of the group are PGL2 of AF because the group is split at all finite primes. So inside of there, we're gonna define a maximal open compact subgroup by uh, taking the, the product over all finite places of PGL2 of the local ring of integers. And that's a maximal compact subgroup of PGL2 of K lambda. Okay, so with that algebraic group and that choice of an open compact subgroup of the finite idyllic points, we define a Riemann surface as an orbit space of G of K, B star mod K star, acting on the product of the upper and lower half planes cross the cosets of M of one in the finite idyllic point. So this is definitely Deline's point of view. How G of K acts on the left of the, of the finite idyllic points by left multiplication, and it acts on the upper and lower half plane through the fact that G of K V, the unique real place that's split in this quaternion algebra is PGL 2 R, and that's the automorphism group of the upper and lower half planes. Okay, now let's unwind this orbit space to see what we really have. And that you always do in this, uh, in the Deline approach to get down to something that looks like an algebraic curve. So first of all, <clears throat> A miraculous thing in this situation, because we've taken a maximal open compact subgroup, is there's only a, there's only one orbit of G of K on this coset space, and <clears throat> that orbit has stabilizer conjugate to the units of a maximal order modulo the units of the uh, totally real field, and so that's in general not the case. There are always a finite number of orbits, but in this case, there's only one orbit. In that case, we can say that this <clears throat> double orbit space reduces to the orbits of the units of the quaternion algebra, modulo the units of the field, acting on the upper and lower half plane. And the theorem of Eichler tells you that there is always a unit whose norm is negative at the place V <clears throat> in the units of A star, and that unit switches the upper and lower half planes. So this orbit space can be identified with the units which are positive, positive norm at all real places, uh, acting on the upper half plane. Now, <clears throat> the reason it's positive norm at all real places is that at the two other real places, the quaternion algebra is Hamilton's quaternions and all, unit, and all norms are positive. Good. Well, as I said, if the norm is positive, it's a positive, totally positive unit and totally positive units are a square. And so by modifying this element in the quaternion algebra by the square root of its norm, we get an element of norm one. And it's well-defined up to plus or minus one, up to what square root we take. And so this Riemann surface that's defined in Deline's way as a, 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 an orbit space is actually the quotient of the upper half plane by the units of norm one modulo plus or minus one. And that Shimura had shown was the triangle group. So X of one, is the Riemann surface P1, which is the quotient of the upper half plane by the triangle group. Now, how does that help us get Hurwitz curves? Well, we get arithmetic 
coverings of X of one by taking normal subgroups of this open compact subgroup. Those are the congruent subgroups when you go to the discrete group. And so here's how Shimura describes a certain number of congruent subgroups, which will be all we need. He takes a prime ideal of the ring of integers of the totally real field uh, with residue field Fp, and we assume that Q is the order of elements of this finite residue field. And uh, then this finite group, which is PGL2 of Fp, which is a quotient of one of the groups occurring in the product for M of one, PGL2 of Ap, it acts triply transitively on the points of the projective line, or the Q plus one points. And so it makes sense to take the stabilizer of one point or the stabilizer of two points or the stabilizer of three points. And we call those groups M of P, those, that's the group stabilizing all three points. So that's the group acting trivially on the projective line mod P. And we call M0 of P squared, the group stabilizing two of the points on the projective line and M0 of P, the group stabilizing one point. So just as this group reduces to PGL2 of FP, M0 of P reduces to a Borel in PGL2 FP, M0 of P squared reduces to a torus in PGL2 of FP, and M of P reduces to the identity. That's a normal subgroup of PGL2. And associated to those various subgroups of finite index in our open compact subgroup, we get Riemann surfaces each one. So this is the one I'd call X of P. If I, if instead of taking the orbits of M of one, I took the orbits of this smaller group M of P. There are more orbits in that case. And I could equally well do it with M zero of P squared or M zero of P. And when I do that, I not only get these maps, uh-oh. Boy, this is so weird. Let's try again. We get maps from the different curves as we mount out by the smaller and smaller subgroups, covering maps. And these are uh, curves that map to our projective line. And even X of P is a Galois covering mapping to our projective line. Okay, now Shimura proves, and this is the big theorem in his paper, that all of these curves are not just complex Riemann surfaces, but they have canonical models over the cubic field Sorry, minor interruption. They have canonical models over this original cubic field, which is embedded in the complex numbers by the real place V. So that's his big theorem. And this is extremely difficult to prove because these curves, unlike Shimura curves over the rational numbers, do not represent a simple moduli problem. Uh, and he only is able to get the field of definition to be K after a huge amount of work. And the curves, original curve, which was P1, and these curves X0 of P and X0 of P squared are geometrically connected. In Deline's theory, a curve doesn't have to be connected at all. That's why he gets a small field of definition of K. But the curve X of P is a Galois extension of X of one, where the group is PGL2 of Q because you've modded out by a normal subgroup. And it turns out to be geometrically connected only in the case where the prime is the unique prime dividing two. Two is inert in this field K. But when the prime is odd residue characteristic, it has two components over the complex numbers. And the components are rational over a quadratic extension of, of little k, uh, which is the unique quadratic extension of discriminant p. And they give Galois coverings, but the group is not PGL2 of fp, but actually PSL2 of fp and their h curves. And Shimura goes on to discuss these H curves in his paper and their new examples at the time he wrote the paper. So for example, the ones of genus three, seven, 14, and 118 correspond to prime ideals where the norm of P is seven, eight, 13, and 27. So that seven is the unique ramified prime in K and eight is the norm of the unique prime dividing two. And there are three ideals of norm 13 because 13 splits in this uh, totally real field. <clears throat> and Shimura shows that those three Hurwitz curves, which have genus 14, are non-isomorphic. And those at the time he wrote the paper were new Hurwitz curves. Okay. Now we're gonna focus on the case where P is the prime dividing two. And the Shimura curve X of two, 
the full Shimura curve, gives a canonical descent of the Fricka McBeath curve together with all of its automorphisms to this totally real field. People had written down models of the Fricka McBeath curve even over the rationals, but the automorphisms are not defined there. If you want the curve as a Hurwitz curve, the minimal field of definition is this totally real field. Fricka, uh, excuse me, McBeath defines it over seventh roots of unity. It's a little harder to get it down to the totally real subfield. Okay, and just as we did in the complex case, we can, once we have the automorphisms, we can take quotient curves by those automorphisms, which are defined over K. And when you divide out by the Klein four groups, as we did in the complex case, you get curves of genus one, which Elkies and I show are actually elliptic curves. Namely, they have rational points. And it's an elliptic curve whose conductor is two squared, the ideal two squared over K. And um, we don't really need equations for this, but if you, for example, if you want to identify it and you have your, <laughs> your L functions and modular forms database handy, it's uh, the elliptic curve they call 64.1-A7. 64 is two to the sixth, which is the norm of the conductor. Uh, but it turns out to descend uniquely to the rational numbers. So uh, if you wanted to have an equation over the rational numbers, it's given by this equation. And notice that it has bad reduction in the rational case at the prime two and seven, but seven ramifies in the cubic extension. And when you get to the cubic extension, it has good reduction at the prime seven and bad reduction only at the prime two. Okay, and just as we did in the complex case, the Jacobian of the Frick and McBeef curve over the totally real field is isogenous to the seventh power of this elliptic curve. Again, you decompose the differentials of the first kind by pulling back the elliptic differentials from these quotient to give the eigenspaces. Great. Okay. Now, with that geometric information about the Frick and McBeef curve over the totally real field, <clears throat> let's go back to the theory of automorphic forms and take an arbitrary prime in this totally real field and recall these covering curves, x of p, x zero p squared, x zero p, and x of one. And this notation is meant to suggest the notation we use for these curves over the rationals. Now, one consequence of Shimura's theory, uh, producing these curves uh, using uh, arithmetic groups, is that a holomorphic differential, which is on x zero of p or x zero p squared, which turns out to be an eigenvector for all the Hecke correspondences. And by the way, the Hecke correspondences at unramified primes are also all defined over the totally real field in Shimura's case. Well, <clears throat> if you have an eigenvector for all of the correspondences, that corresponds to a new vector in an automorphic representation of the idyllic points of this group B star mod K star. <clears throat> if, the, if the eigenvector occurs on the curve X zero of P, then that's a automorphic representation of conductor P. And if it occurs on the curve X zero P squared, but not on X zero P, that's an automorphic representation of conductor P squared. And the representation, at least at infinity, we know at, at the split prime <coughs> where the group is PGL two R, the local representation is the holomorphic discrete series of weight two. And at the two ramified primes where the, um, group is compact, it's the trivial representation. Now, <clears throat> by a result of Jacques K. Langlands, when you have an automorphic form for one of these quaternion algebras, you can lift it to a, an automorphic representation of the split group, which in this case is PGL2, as conductor P or P squared. And in this case, because uh, the trivial representation of the compact group corresponds to the discrete series of weight two, it's now in the discrete series of weight two at all three real places. So this, in classical language would just be a Hilbert modular form of weight 222 two, two, and conductor P or P squared. Anytime you find an, in, uh, a differential on these curves, which is an eigenfunction for the Heck operators. Now, it's unra this, this representation is unramified at all primes other than P because its conductor is P or P squared. And at P, you wanna try to find the local representation. You can't say a priori what it is, but if you know something about the um, subspace of the differentials on X of P that span by the G translates of your invariant differential here, 
that gives you some information on the local representation of PGL2 of KP that occurs in this uh, automorphic representation. So I'll do an example for you. Let's uh, take our favorite case where the prime is two. Then it turns out mm, that the curve x0 of two has genus zero. Uh, so there are no uh, eigen differentials there. And x0 of four has genus one. So any non-zero differential is an eigenvector for the heck operators. The former turns out to be the projective line. This curve of genus zero has a point on it. And the latter <laughs> turns out to be the unique homogeneous space for this elliptic curve we've discussed, uh, which is non-trivial at the three real places and trivial elsewhere. You know, you can tell that the, um, that the uh, local uh, triviality and non-triviality, the homogeneous space determines it because the tate shafarevich group of this elliptic curve is trivial. It turns out the Bergen Swinner entire conjecture is true too. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we have on x zero of four a uh, an eigen differential, and so that gives us a unique cuspidal automorphic representation of a split group with the following local behavior. First of all, as I said, at each real place, the representation is in the discrete series of weight two. Now, what about at this? bad place. Okay, well, I claim, <clears throat> well, first the representation as conductor P squared because it comes from the curve X0 of two squared and, and not X0 of two. And it's in the discrete, I claim the representation is a depth zero discrete series and it's compactly induced from our favorite representation of dimension seven, the one that occurs on the differentials of the Frick and McBeef curve, because that's the only representation that occurs on the differentials of the Frick and McBeef curve. And remember that that's associated to the two cubic characters of the non-split torus. By the way, as I say, the non-split torus has dimension, has order nine in this case. And if you restrict the discrete series representation to this uh, non-split torus, you get the seven characters which are not equal to chi three and chi three inverse. It's amusing that the two characters that are used to define the discrete series are exactly the ones that don't appear in the restriction to the non-split torus. And finally, at all other places, it's an unramified representation because the only prime which is bad for the Frick and McBeef curve is the prime two. Okay, now we're gonna go even further. Take another quaternion algebra, which is ramified at the three real places, all three real places, so it's definite, and at the prime two. So previously we had two other quaternion algebras. We had the original one to define the Shimura curve, which was ramified at two infinite places. Then we had the split algebra ramified nowhere. And now we go to the definite algebra ramified at four places. And we let G be the inner, G star be the inner form of the algebraic group with associated points. Well, then again, the theory of Jacquet Langlands applies because for the representations of the split group at these four places, the local representation is in the discrete series. So we get a unique automorphic representation of this, of this non-split form of PGL2, which is now the trivial representation at all real places and the two-dimensional representation of the compact group at the place two, which factors through a dihedral quotient of order six and whose restriction to the cyclic subgroup is the direct sum of the two cubic characters, chi three and chi three inverse. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> first of all, it has conductor P squared. And so that means it's trivial on the one units. And if you take the quotient of the multiplicative group of this depth of this compact quaternion algebra modulo of the one units, that turns out to be a dihedral group of order 18. And the reason you factors through the dihedral group of order six is that it's a famous theorem that the correspondence of these two representations, one of the split group, one of the non-split group, the trace on, on uh, any torus that embeds in both of them, say the non-split unramified torus is zero, namely it's the regular representation of the torus. And in the group PGL2, we got all the characters except chi three and chi three inverse where we restricted. So in this, compact group, we get the two characters, chi three and chi three inverse, and that gives us the two dimensional representation of the dihedral group. And at the finite primes, we get uh, the same unramified representation that we did for PGL2. So here we have 
a new automorphic representation of a definite quaternion algebra, in some sense simpler than the Hilbert modular form. And why did we do this? Well, one reason we did this is now there's a unique invariant translinear form on the local representations for every place V. So at the unramified places, it's known that there's a trilinear form. At, for the compact group, we have the trivial representation. So if you take its triple tensor product, it certainly contains the trivial representation. And at this place, we have <coughs> the two-dimensional representation of the dihedral group. And if you take its triple tensor product, which has order eight, it has a unique invariant vector. Whereas if you work with any of the other quaternion algebras, you, um, you don't get a trilinear form. So the point of going to this definite quaternion algebra is to get an invariant trilinear form on the local representations for every place V. Well, that means, adelically, there's an invariant linear form on the automorphic representation, which is unique up to scaling because that invariant linear form is the tensor product of the invariant linear forms locally. Okay, now, being in a one-dimensional vector space doesn't mean you're non-zero. And we can define a linear form on this triple tensor product by integration over the diagonal. And that's a period, like it sometimes says, and that period defines a G star A invariant linear form, but perhaps it's zero, perhaps it's non-zero. And we're going to address the non-triviality of this form using the triple product L function. And that's an L function. Pi has an Euler, the L function of pi is an Euler product of degree two. This is an Euler product of degree eight. And it's known by Garrett's integral representation that it satisfies a functional equation when S is replaced with four minus S with sine plus one. In fact, the local signs are non-trivial precisely at the three infinite places and the prime dividing two. Okay, and the result I'm going to quote of Harris and Kudla, which they published a little before our paper, is that this period inner form is non-zero in this one-dimensional vector space if and only if the triple product L function is non-zero in the center of its critical strip. And uh, that's quite a useful theorem because <clears throat> sometimes one knows something about the L function and one concludes something about the period, and in some kinds, one knows something about the period and allows one to compute something about the L function. And we're gonna use the period to prove that the L function doesn't vanish at two. Okay, why? Well, it looks like this is a very difficult thing. It's a, it's a, it's a linear form on a very, uh, of, a, of an infinite dimensional representation, but you can often test the non-triviality of this linear form by using what I call a test vector namely a certain vector in the representation for the invariant trilinear form. And the components of this test vector are, are chosen to span a line fixed by a certain open compact subgroup on which the local linear form is non-zero. And the trick is to find this open compact subgroup with the nice test vector property. Well, in this case, without going into any details, one can find the open compact subgroup. I won't give it. And the miracle is, that the test function is now defined on a double coset space. First of all, it's automorphic. So uh, <laughs> it's on G star A cube modulo G star K cube. But since it's invariant under this open subgroup of this adelic group, it's, it, it's, on, it's invariant on the right by translation by that open compact subgroup. And when you actually work it out, this space, double coset space has only five elements in it. So it's something even I can handle. And um, you can identify which line is where the test function is using one spherical heck operator, which gives you a five by five matrix and you find the eigenvalue for that heck operator. And this is a computation I did in 10 minutes, even with a little bit at making errors. And the integration over the diagonal, this period that we're supposed to be testing on the test vector is just evaluation of the function on this line on one of the double cosets, the double coset coming from the diagonal embedding. And you find very quickly that the value of this test function on that diagonal is non-zero. And so with almost no computation, you prove by the result of Steve and Michael that the triple product L function is non-zero in the center of its critical strip. Okay, great. That's a result purely on automorphic forms. You have an automorphic form, it's characterized by its local behavior, you calculate the triple product L function, it's non-zero in the center. Great, well, how do we use that? Well, 
first of all, why is it so simple? Why do we only get five elements? Well, the first thing is that we're working on a definite quaternion algebra. That tells us that this double coset space we're going to be computing with is finite. But that's not enough. The miracle is that up to conjugacy, this definite quaternion algebra also contains a unique maximal order, which has class number one. There are only a finite number of definite quaternion algebras with this property, and this is one of them. And what is the maximal order once you realize it's unique? Well, it's the famous Hurwitz order extended to the ring A. So Hurwitz wrote down a, a maximal order in Hamilton's quaternions, where the equations are I squared, J squared, K squared, and I, J, K are minus one, uh, given by the span of I, J, K, and one plus I plus J plus K over two. That's a, that's a sixth root of unity. And if you just extend scalars to A, you get the maximal order in this definite quaternion algebra. Nothing could be nicer than that. I was a little puzzled by this because I was, where's the element of order seven? But of course, there is no element of order seven in the maximal order because <clears throat> the primes seven, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the prime, uh, the prime two is, is not, is not, uh, the prime two splits in the quadratic extension given by seventh roots of unity. And the prime two is ramified in this quaternion algebra. So you can't embed the seventh roots of unity in a maximal order. So you get fourth roots of unity and sixth roots of unity, but not seventh roots of unity. Great. All right. Now let's go back to geometry. If we take the Jacobian of this uh, curve x0 of 2 squared, well, since it was a homogeneous space for E, the Jacobian is isomorphic to our elliptic curve. And Shimura proves that this elliptic curve is modular over the totally real field, namely the L function that you define using the Tate module of the elliptic curve as an Euler product is the same as the L function of this Hilbert modular form of weight 222. And that allows you to for example, test the conjecture of Birch and Swinnert and Dyer for this elliptic curve and analytically continue the L function to the entire plane. But once you have that, then the triple product L function is also a expression in terms of motivic L functions. It's given by the L function of the triple tensor product of the Tate module, which is the symmetric cube of the Tate module and two copies of the original module uh, twisted by minus one. So the L function becomes the L function of the symmetric cube at S times the L function of the elliptic curve <clears throat> at S minus one squared. And the fact that the triple product L function doesn't vanish at S equal two means that the symmetric cube L function doesn't vanish at S equal two and the original L function of the elliptic curve doesn't vanish at S equal one. So as I said, by Birch and Swinnert and Dyer, that would predict that the rank of this elliptic curve over the totally real field is zero. And in fact, that's the case. The uh, torsion subgroup is Z mod two squared cross Z mod three. The tate shafarevich group is trivial and uh, you can prove the conjecture of Birch and Swinnert and Dyer. Good. Now, uh, the Jacobian of the Fricka McBeef curve we saw was isogenous to the sevenfold product of the elliptic curve. And that gives an identity of the motives of rank 14, namely the first cohomology of the Fricka McBeef curve is just seven copies of the two-dimensional representation coming from the first cohomology of E. Okay, so that allows us um, to study the triple product of the Fricka McBeef curve. So if we let Y be the triple product, I claim that uh, the, the third cohomology of Y, the middle cohomology of this triple product is 343 copies the symmetric cube of H1 of E plus 707 copies of the original tape module twisted. And the reason is that once you have <clears throat> the cohomology of uh, X, you can compute the cohomology of Y using the Quinneth formula. And these are the only representations that intervene. Oh, now I have another thing frozen. Let me see if I can unfreeze. Okay, let's try again. Good. Now, <clears throat> That's nice because Balenson and Bloch have suggested that the Chow group of co-dimension two cycles homologous to zero on any threefold should be finitely generated if it, the threefold is defined over a number field. And it should <clears throat> have rank equal to the order of vanishing the L function of the third cohomology group of Y at the point S equal two. Now, I don't know if one takes this 
too seriously. You could even go all the way back and attribute it to Swinnerton and Dyer, but there's really no evidence for this at all. It's just a hope. Uh, Spencer Block likes to call it a recurring fantasy. In any case, in this case, we can actually calculate the L function. The L function is 343 times the L function of the symmetric cube of E and 707 copies of the L function of E. So miraculously for this threefold, the threefold product of the Fricka McBeef curve, the order of vanishing at S equal two is zero because these two L functions by the triple product L function don't vanish at the points S equal two. Well, that's good. Well, that leads to the following expectation. So if we take this totally real field and let X be the Frick and McBeef curve, then any co-dimension two cycle on its triple product, which is defined over the totally real field and is homologous to zero, should have finite order in the Chow group because in fact, the rank of the Chow group is supposed to be the order of vanishing and the order of vanishing is zero. So if we believe these conjectures of Swinnerton, Dyer, and Balenson and Block, we're led to this expectation that anytime we can construct a cycle which is homologous to zero, that it should have finite order. Great, well, the modified diagonal cycle in the triple product, which is made out of just the diagonal embedding, is defined over the totally real field and is homologous to zero for any choice of E. E is a <coughs> divisor class of a positive degree on X. So here it is, it's something homologous to zero from the expectation we're supposed to prove it's torsion. That's really bizarre. And I was motivated in this by this result, as I say, of Bisogno, Lee, Litt, and Srinivasan, who showed that the image of this diagonal cycle under the l attic Abel-Jacoi map is torsion. Well, that's, that's good evidence, but we don't know enough about the Abel-Jacobi map for higher co-dimension to conclude that the original cycle is torsion. And they published this, it, it really jumped out at me because I had come to the expectation based on work I did with Chad Shin that this thing, this modified diagonal cycle should only be torsion in very rare cases like hyperelliptic curves. And the Frick and McBeef curve is not hyperelliptic. And so that led me to investigate this and at least from the point of view of the triple product L function, and these conjectures of Balenson and Block, it's not unreasonable to expect it to be homologous to zero. But how would one ever prove, uh, it, not expect it to be trivial in the Chow group, but how would one ever prove that something was uh, trivial when it had co-dimension two? Well, what you have to do to actually work with the definition, because that's really all we have, is we need to find a collection of surfaces in this threefold Y, which are defined over our number field K and some rational functions on those surfaces uh, such that the divisors of those rational functions add up to this modified diagonal cycle. That's, that's what would physically be required. And they can't be obvious because they're not gonna exist on every triple product. Usually this cycle is very non-torsion. And so it has to be some peculiarity related to the Frick and McBeef curve or uh, its definition using quaternion algebras or something like that. And the only thing I can think of, although I haven't been able to work it out, is there are some surfaces which are Shimura surfaces associated to the quaternion algebra ramified at one real place and the prime dividing two. Namely, we've used now three quaternion algebras, ramified at two real places, ramified at no places, and ramified at three real places in P. Well, how about the quaternion algebra ramified at one real place and the prime two? That's split at two real places, and so the the double coset space I define gives you a surface. And that surface, if you look at its cohomology, looks like it could conceivably map to Y, but I don't have any uh, proof of that. In any case, I suggest that this might be something we could look at. We know so little about co-dimension two cycles or co-dimension greater than one cycles that this case might actually be um, valuable to study in more detail. So let me end with a, a picture. There we are. So <clears throat> here you have a young man exploring space through a telescope and exploring microbiology through a microscope. So there are different ways of looking at mathematics. And Sarah once said to me that he began life looking at mathematics through a telescope, but uh, now he enjoys looking at things through a microscope. And um, I think this talk is kind of 
child groups through an absolute microscope. But um, <clears throat> these, these relations on cycles have been around since the early 50s when uh, Pierre Samuel defined adequate equivalence relations, homological, algebraic, rational equivalence. And we know that they have nice functorial properties, but, but beyond the case of co-dimension one, we really don't know how to prove finiteness theorems like the mordell Bay theorem. And um, I just think a little bit of microscopic analysis in this case might be very useful. So um, happy birthday, Steve, and thank you all for listening to the talk. All right, um, you can unmute and, and, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. If I can understand them. And he just said he was happy. To, Steve, you're required to ask a question. Ah, uh, so are there other cases where you can twist around here and see things which are vanishing? Are you expecting to be non-vanishing? In other words, that okay, I mean, maybe. Uh, I, I, it, you know, this it's just such a unique automorphic form, a unique automorphic representation with that ramification. Uh, right. I mean, I, you're, you're absolutely right that one could twist by a character of this totally real field and get something where the sine of the L function was minus one, et cetera. But <clears throat> that would prove that some cycle was non-trivial, presumably. And, and that's what we're going to see in, in uh, Chow Lee's talk and uh, other talks. Uh, you could you know, sometimes prove that something's non-zero in the Chow group. But I'm, I'm trying to understand how we ever get upper bounds and prove finiteness for it. Sure. Of course, another analogous question is the question if you have an elliptic curve of rank bigger than one, modular elliptic curve of rank bigger than one, it means that the, child, the, the Hegner points are trivial in cohomology. And I think you once wrote a paper giving some examples in which you could write down the exactly. actual modular forms which provide that, that the triviality. But I don't know if there's everything, been anything totally systematic about that. I mean, no, you know, I, but I think I always, just Yeah, I always had the belief, Steve, that. <clears throat> that you might be able to get something in the rank two case from, or the rank three case from the vanishing of the Hegner point. Namely, it would be like a secondary topological invariant where you use the, the function whose divisor was supported on the Hegner points to construct something else. Right. Um, I never got anywhere with that. Henri has made a lot of progress on the, on the rank two case. And, um, but I, I, in the, that, you know, the, the, the equivalence relation for cycles of co-dimension one are very explicit. You, you just have to find a function. But, but when you get higher co-dimension, you have to find a subvariety and a function on that. It really becomes quite complicated. And there's certainly no canonical way of trivializing it. That's the real problem. No, exactly. I mean, I think I, I had a paper, this most recent thing that I wrote was looking at these kinds of Shimura varieties where you take a totally real field and you choose an orthogonal group of type signature M minus two, two at some places and positive definite the other. And, and then you look at the cycles that I studied with Milson and those guys there. And what happens is if you, if you look at the co-dimensions where the number of non-compact places is more than one, then the cycles don't live the geometrically constructed things which have a natural construction like I did with the old stuff with Milson occur in multiples of the number of non-compact places, right? So if you're non-compact at one place, then you have every, every co-dimension you see cycles. And so you can imagine you could get relations by using those as your sub-varieties on I which see. your live. But when you have the number of non-compact places is larger, there is no evident uh, modular, I mean, or say Shimura variety constructed varieties of co-dimension one more. Got it. One less on which you could look for paramorphic functions. And so you can write down the generating series for these kind of uh, uh, cycles of these higher co-dimensions, but there's no evident reason why these things should be modular. And so on the other hand, what I showed in this paper is that following Wei Zhang and, and uh, Cho Zhang's uh, suggestion about using my old work with Milson, is you can show that if you believe block balancing about the injection into the mm -hmm. odd quantity, that indeed these are modular. They're all modular forms. But there's absolutely no evident relations among these cycles, which must be there if these are going to be modular forms. Interesting, interesting. Okay, I'll take a look. Kind of in the sense that they're just, you know, you have all these things. If you believe that basic sort of conjecture or fantasy, then these should be modular. And yet there's absolutely no way. And you can write down examples where essentially you have a, a, um, a, 
I guess a threefold, I can't remember the exact, so similar to the thing case you're looking at where you have, you, what you would need is you need some curves. You get some zero cycles, right. which you know should be trivial uh, according to Bert, the, the conjecture. But on the other hand, you need some curves and there are no curves that you could exactly. construct their way. And so, you know, you're, you, you have this huge, it's sort of like dark matter, right? I mean, there's sort right. of, it's just, it's, it's something, it's something's working here if you believe the recurring fantasy, but there's no evidence of what it could be. Yeah, I mean, Shimura varieties, sub varieties are like light matter and everything else is dark matter. Exactly, exactly. So there's, some, okay. there's got to be lots of dark matter. That's what these examples seem to show. And uh, there we are. It's, it's okay. about the same. Maybe there's better uh, the astronomical. So we're coming to the astronomical analogy here. Good, good, good. I'll get back to the telescope. <laughs> Thanks. Other questions? Right. Do we have any other questions? Uh, uh, Dick? So, uh, so here you look at the triple product or something for, for this uh, automorphism over, over this cubic field. So have you also look at uh, you know, the RCIO function? So let me, you have a cubic, a cubic extension already. So yes, you just uh, consider this, uh, you know, long split triple product where- Nice. Yeah, over, uh, yeah, you embed GO2 of Q inside your cubic extension, GO2 of cubic extension. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, the root number of computation, have you like look at or? I haven't, I, I haven't looked at it all way, but it sounds like a great idea. <laughs> okay, anyway. By the way, you should now finish your, um, your paper with Shou, since I have both of you on, you both need to finish your paper on the derivative of the triple product L function because you know enough now about the arithmetic fundamental lemma to finish that paper. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. So we, we had a, we made one conjecture in a paper, even uh, two years ago, um, solved the conjecture. And uh, so, so now we can, we can prove more cases, but I was still have not sure we could comp prove everything we uh -huh. claimed. So, so, we, we, so the paper still not, is not empty, but I don't know how full it is. Okay. <laughs> I still yeah. think you're very close. You must be very close. By the way, does Ethan also done similar thing? I forget it. We, what's Ethan doing? Um, did he prove something like that? Oh yeah, Ethan, uh, I think he proved uh, in the case of, uh, I think in the case of rank, rank zero, he proved the similar group is finite. In the triple product. Oh, similar group is finite. Right, so not, not, not in this sort of a, a Torsion, uh, torsion is of Chow, Chow group, but. Uh -huh. so uh, that no, okay, like, okay. So that would imply stuff. that their Abel Jacobi image is. is yeah, it's torsion, group. right. I, I, I think that, that would imply that actually, yeah. So, so actually, right, I think this triple product result of Yifeng would actually imply already. Once you know L function has order zero, then those uh, diagonal cycles should actually be torsion in the, in the L Right, uh, that, that's, as I say, what, what the, what the four author paper proves, but they only use group theory. They don't use anything about triple product alpha. Uh -huh. okay. I mean, theoretically, uh, the heights can be computed, right? Using uh, my formula, yeah, but, but I don't know don't, how. But we don't know that the height pairing is non-degenerate. Right, right, probably not useful. <laughs> Well, so you need to find another clever method, to exactly. like a you and a, and a, and a Charles Sean are doing, you know, so it does some good symmetry. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's a very large automorphism group and somehow one should be able to use that, but I haven't been able to. So, so you believe there must be a good reason why it is torsion? I do, I do. I, it's so remarkable for a non-hyperelliptic curve of that genus to have a trivial class. It, it must be some very simple explanation for it. So just out of curiosity, what about the uh, the klein quartic case, the triple product of a klein In that case, the triple product L function has a simple zero and the diagonal cycle is non-zero. So it just, <laughs> it, it, just, it just happens in that case that, that um, you don't, that the local representation at the, at the prime seven is, the split group supports the trilinear form. So you don't, you don't get this phenomenon. And the next case, the next genus? Oh, forget it, forget it, forget <laughs> it. <laughs> Much worse. All right, do we have any more questions for Dick? 
Yeah, I was wondering uh, how many of, of all the Horowitz groups can you get in this manner? I mean, can you get, can you use like congruence groups associated with ideals that are not prime? Like of products? course, of course. But they're all, they're all groups of, of the form products of PGL or PSLP and PSLQ, that kind of thing. You don't get monster groups or anything like that. So the arithmetic, the arithmetic Hurwitz curves are very special. Okay, so you, and you, so this means you probably get only a small fraction, like zero percent of all the Hurwitz curves, right? I, I think that's safe to say yes. I mean, I haven't done the counting, but yes. Initially, you get all of them at the small genuses, and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah, as except as expected. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Anything else? If not. Let's thank Dick again. I'll be back Wednesday, Steve. I'll be back thank Wednesday. You.